Welcome to the Lifestyle First podcast, discussing lifestyle medicine and making self-care as easy as one, two, three. One question, two research reviews, and three actionable health tips, all centered around the Lifestyle First method, your blueprint for the 10 key routes of optimal health and happiness. And now your host, lifestyle medicine physician and coach, Dr. Alka Patel. Hello and welcome. This is series three, episode nine. And the theme in the Lifestyle First Method we'll be exploring today is E, emotions. Now emotions infiltrate into our every day and we need to acknowledge them, call out our emotions, recognize that emotions are our signals that drive our actions. And it's what we do as a result of our emotions that has impact. Emotions are our most powerful driving force. They impact on health in a wide arena and in a profound way. And so today, the one question we'll be focusing on is, can emotional well-being heal chronic illness? And the two pieces of information we've been looking at to support this discussion are the book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers by Robert Sapolsky and the journal article, Emotional Wellbeing and Its Relation to Health, published in the British Medical Journal. So today, to explore the question, can emotional well-being heal chronic illness, I have with me Dr. Indra Panaditaratan. Indra was an NHS GP for over 16 years and she's now left her NHS practice some four years ago to set up her own private functional medicine practice, which she now runs alongside a team of doctors, coaches and a nutritional therapist. So Indra, over to you. Welcome. And perhaps you could start by talking about emotional well-being. How do we actually define that? Thank you for having me on, uh, Alka. It's uh, lovely to speak to you. And emotional well-being. I think for me, emotional well-being, once I started working, after I'd left the NHS, Um, or while I was working at the NHS, I realized that we are experiencing quite an epidemic of chronic chronic disease. And really what we were struggling to do was to find a way to actually help these people. And as I started up my practice and started using a sort of a functional medicine approach to um, chronic disease, I realized there was still one element that we weren't dealing with. And when I started looking into it, one of the things I realized, it was what we kind of call emotional well-being. And what I look at it as, it's your ability to manage stress or to kind of um, have the capacity within your body and your mind to um, recover from stressful situations. So there's kind of a couple of ways I kind of look at it. But in essence, the easiest way to look at it is your ability to manage, or to do practice stress management is the way I would sort of say. And the reason I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about this is that in both conventional medicine and in functional medicine, we're still looking quite a lot into the biological imbalances that are going on. And, you know, why have people got IBS or why have they got a pain here? And we're always looking to see which is the biological imbalance and using things like supplements or medications. But what we're finding is, even if we go and use nutrition and supplements and things like that, people only get so far. And then we get stuck again. And that's where I think emotional well-being comes into it. And it should be part of your whole management plan, but actually diving into that side of it I think it's really, really crucial for health and healing. I remembered a book that I had read before, is Why Zebras Get Ulcers or something around that sort of name. And also some articles that I had um, looked at about emotional well-being. And I think it's really important to kind of go back to understanding what health is, I guess, as well. And why emotional well-being is something that I've realized is very important in my patient's care. And one of the things I use and I talk a lot about is the WHO definition of health being that it's actually 
a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just an absence of symptoms. So that's quite interesting, really, because I think our conventional way of working is very much about getting rid of symptoms rather than looking at the whole picture. Yeah. I think that WHO definition has had a uh quite a mixed review actually hasn't it interestingly so absolutely it feels very holistic and all encompassing um, which is a really positive trait but it's, I think it's also been criticized because there are some unmeasurables there how do you measure holistic well-being and a complete yeah. state of emotional well-being and then there's the quantitative and that qualitative approach as well um, and you're right I think that sort of pickup that you've made with sort of emotions and stress being connected emotional health I think very much it's about the signals we receive to take action and necessarily sort of think about what happens next and and what we what we do next so it's very integral absolutely to sort of uh, our response to, to life really absolutely I mean the article that I was reading um, as uh, the BMJ article about the social well-being it was saying that there's even more evidence now saying that if there is a stress or the effect of stress, it really does affect our ability to look at viral infections and how we manage viral infections, how our body deals with it, and also even cardiovascular disease. So trying to get that tangibility of what that emotional well-being, I think we're seeing it expressed in our physical symptoms. So I think what we find is that as we get more well-being within us and we are more resilient to deal with the stresses around us we tend to find that our patient symptoms kind of start to come down and their ability to deal with um, infections and chronic disease all starts to improve so it's difficult in the sense that you can't really tangibly say to anybody this is diagnosis of well-being but I think if we look at it as an expression in our body as our physical symptoms and they're reducing it we tend to find that the emotional well-being kind of goes up with that. Absolutely. And there are other measures, you know, measuring our cortisol hormone levels, for example. We know yeah. there's to be a shift and a change change in that. Um, but I think there is definitely that sort of more qualitative measure that we need to put, um, put into place um, as well, really. So, um, yeah, really interesting stuff. So when, um, when I was thinking about stress, because that's really the key part of all of this, isn't it? <laughs> it's the effect of stress on us and what it, um, what it does. And I think for me, that has been really interesting, kind of diving in to understand the effect of stress and then kind of diving in further to understand what is stress mm -hmm. in itself. And reading this book, I've really understood or be really, it's, it's kind of opened my mind and it's made that connection for me between stress and the physical symptoms. Because sure. I think... In, 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 in when I was used to be in GP land, I used to say, oh, well, this is stress. And people go, oh, yeah, okay. And then they would go, but actually, what is that? What is it actually doing to us? And the more I've been learning about it, the more it makes so much sense to why we're experiencing the symptoms that we're experiencing. Um, and the fact is, stress is part of our balancing system. Yeah. So... We, we all have that, don't we? But yes, you know, to every reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So, you know, counter to stress, there is relaxation. And yet, you know, which is it that takes predominance in our life? I think we're so used to being busy, you know, the human being aspect of us. We're always doing, but we're not just giving ourselves space to just be. Perhaps we should be called human doings um, instead, actually. Um, but we are almost obsessed with that sort of sense of productivity and performance. And I think it's, you know, it's critical and it's really important and it's how we flourish and evolve and grow and thrive um, through that. But I think there also is emerging information now, isn't there, about that sense of doing nothing and how doing nothing is equally, if not more, important than actually constantly being producers of something else and, and something else. So how do we start to infiltrate that into our day-to-day? -day? I think it's one of the things I've realized just in my own life, and you're, you're completely right with this human being and human doing, because I think society is very much about productivity and moving and doing. But actually what we tend to find with people who are under pressure 
or stress is that we feel as though we're not able to achieve what we need to achieve. So if we can just maybe sit back and look and really understand where that thinking is coming from Mm -hmm. and really realizing that stopping often actually helps productivity. Um, And I know I've done this and more I sort of uh, work within my practice and learn more about the effects of stress. And, and just one thing I've really, really realized is that when I am feeling under pressure and I am trying to get X, Y, and Z out, one of the first things I began to realize is before I'd get so worked up about it, I'd get so frustrated and you think, oh gosh, how am I going to do it? And you just keep plodding away at something. And one thing I've realized is I just need to stop at this point. And that's really what our body's telling us. Our body is telling us, stop. Yeah. But we don't listen, do we? We just keep (laughs) going on. Tune into those those signals. There was a psychologist, wasn't there? What was his name? Graham Wallace many years ago. He talked about sort of creativity and the theory of creativity and highlighting what you're talking about, that sort of incubation period that we all need things to sort of incubate, i.e. stand still in order for creativity to blossom. I think he talked about four stages, preparation, incubation, illumination, and verification. And obviously there's quite a lot of depth to to all of that. But that sense of allowing yourself some stillness actually builds creativity. And I think speaking about emotion, that's when we create our sort of emotional well-being. That's where that comes from, our emotional network of how we respond is created at that time as well, isn't it? Absolutely. I know... Like yesterday, I was sat here trying to figure something out. So then I walked away and I decided, what is it that my body needs at this point in time? And what is it that I need to do? And all I needed to do was just sit and watch some rubbish TV or whatever it was. (laughs) And then as soon as I came back to it, it just happened without, with so much ease, without, with so much, with so much flow that it, it didn't yeah. even feel yeah. like work. Yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, automatically is going to have a different effect on your body straight away, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. But interestingly, though, even watching TV is doing something. Like, when is the last time you actually did nothing? Because we often think, okay, I'm doing nothing, so I'll, I'll do some mindfulness, or I'll journal, or I'll watch TV, yeah. or I'll go for a walk. But you're still doing, aren't you? I think, and isn't it in Buddhism, they talk about the sort of ideal person has nowhere to go and nothing to do. But actually, how do we actually do that where we just let ourselves be with our thoughts and, and nothing else? Um, it's quite a discipline, actually, isn't it? It is, it is. I, I actually did that. Um, I I was sort of uh, challenged in a way to do that probably about six months ago and I take snippets of it through my week and so what the challenge was that I had to sit for five days and do nothing and just really play with the feelings and the thoughts that came up with it So it was basically a case of waking up in the morning and just lying there until there was a natural tendency to just get up and move. And then it was a case of just flowing through what came to me without having, I need to have breakfast, I need to drink, I need to move, I need to do anything. It took me three days until everything started to calm down. So the first few days, it was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, what are, what's the rules? What do I do? What's my limitations and all the rest of it? And then the first day, that was what happened. The second day, I woke up and I just stayed there. And I ended up sleeping till about one o'clock in the afternoon. So that's what my body actually needs, not getting up, walking, all the other things. And by the third day, I woke up, just felt so at peace. It was just beautiful. And again, just flowed through the day, you know, went for a walk if I wanted to, wrote if I wanted to. There wasn't any, it was hard because I had to 
it was hard in the sense I had to plan my family to know that this was my time out week. Yeah. And ever since then, I do that. I, I do have a day where I call my human being day. Oh, God, that's fascinating. <laughs> it is so fascinating that, A, I'm so impressed that you gave yourself those five days to the, and that you saw it out. I think that's uh, incredulous. And you kind of built that into into your life as well um, because you recognize clearly recognize the benefits and impact um, of that as well so um, gosh amazing um, but it is it's that societal pressure you know that drive to we've all got to go and earn a living or we've all got to tend to our families or everything else that drives us that makes that much harder to build in but here you are and you, you know created a mechanism for for doing that and actually gained something amazing from it by the by the sounds of it really and yeah, it, it, she always tuned into your natural rhythms that like we all have those every part of our body every cell has got a rhythm to it those circadian rhythms exist and yet we tune out don't we we completely tune out and that's that's one of the things that when you when you are still your innate wisdom you know the fact that we can heal and that we do really is telling you things all the time but when we're so busy we, we just as you said tune out completely and it just allowed me to kind of completely tune into what my body needed and actually what my body needed is sleep <laughs> I didn't even realize I thought you know I was going to bed at 10 o'clock waking up at seven all completely fine I've had my eight hours of sleep so I should be great but yeah <laughs> okay so i might think about letting my family know I'm out for the cat forget five days i'm not here for the next five years you know <laughs> I'm really and now here is your lifestyle first prescription your three activating actions to take you from knowing to doing i really love you to share just three really key health actions that uh, that we can take from you today well, I think one of the key things that I want people to realize is that you have the answers. Yes. It's there within you. And I see that all the time. And I've, I've had patients come in and go, oh, yeah, I knew that milk didn't suit me, but I still kept taking it. I knew that this, this is it. And even myself, I knew I needed more sleep, but I didn't listen. Yeah. Yeah. So you have the answers. So the next thing is to become curious about what your body's telling you. So that is my second point. Is just kind of be really playful and gentle with yourself. And if there is a pain or if there is something or you're feeling a bit low or something is stressing you, just be curious of what, what it's telling you because there's always the answer. And the third thing I think for me is take time out. Sit and stare. Because often, whatever you're trying to figure out, it will just pop up in front of you. Amazing. Love those. I have the answers. I can sit and stare. Love that. And I'm be curious. curious. I'm curious. That's my favorite. I think we don't do enough of that. I'm hoping that this has been, these some months of lockdown, going through COVID, it's been a real time of introspection for a lot of people. And a lot of us, I think, and I hope, have developed that innate curiosity about ourselves because we've been gifted some of this time to be able to do that. Um, but I think those, those are amazing. That sort of affirmation of I have the answer is a really strong, powerful one to to go forward with so uh, thank you for those so Indra if people want to find out more about you or get in contact with you which I'm sure they will what's the best way to reach you well I've got my website which is drindra.co.uk that's probably the easiest site I am also on Facebook and I think it's Indra Barathon on Facebook I'm still not sure about all the handles business at the moment but I think you'll find us uh, um, on there um, but yeah, those are the two main areas, really. No, no, I'll get those links up so we can definitely make sure people can find a way to you because you've been incredibly interesting, provided some great insights uh, today. So um, that really leaves me just to say thank you so much and uh, hope you have a happy, healthy day. Thank you very much, Alka. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us on the Lifestyle First podcast, making self-care as easy as one, two, three. Don't forget to subscribe and share. 
and we'd love it if you'd be kind enough to leave a review. To learn more or to arrange a consultation, please visit www.dralkapatel.com. See you next time.